Hey everyone, and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. For today's viewer requested and long overdue presentation, we will finally be turning our attention to the public security variant of Chinese Type 56 carbine. Before I begin, super quick housekeeping note, I do apologize for the delays in my videos recently, and I sincerely thank everyone who reached out to me. For anyone who cares but wasn't aware, late last year I was exposed to the fish-based neurotoxin ciguatera, and while most people recover from this with minimal complications, unfortunately in my case it triggered a prolonged and rather debilitating autoimmune response. Long story short, I've been playing life on hard mode for the past four and a half months, and crafting coherent presentations on historically relevant small arms has been borderline impossible. Without further ado, however, that's exactly what we're planning to do today, and if you're watching this now, it means I finally got my ducks in a row, even if just for a little while. Let's get into it. As always, when presenting on a Type 56 carbine variant, we're going to be talking about identification criteria, historical context, collector considerations, and a wide range of other relevant anecdotes. Additionally, we'll be taking a close look at my own public security example and the lesser known factory that made it, but before anything else, I want to make one thing clear. My explicit goal for this video is to provide you, the viewer, with more information on the public security variant of Type 56 carbine than you will find from any other single source. That's nothing new. That's how I try to approach all of these videos. That said, not all information is created equally, and today's presentation will include an unusually high proportion of analysis as compared to simple statements of fact. The thing is, the more research and prep work I put into this specific presentation, the more I appreciated just how little is actually known and verifiable about public security carbines. Although this specific variant has never been my personal area of expertise, I'll admit I always thought I had a pretty good idea of what they were, and as it turns out, I was wrong or I might have been wrong, the point is that after months of sincere inquiry, I have more questions now than when I started. As it turns out, the story behind these things is actually quite confounding, and the more I study them, the less convinced I am by any of the prevailing explanations for what they really are or why they really exist. And in retrospect, that shouldn't be terribly surprising. After all, half of the appeal of being a Type 56 carbon enthusiast is recognizing just how much is still unknown about this family of weapons. Unlike some other weapon patterns that have been scrutinized and documented down to the finest detail, the reality is that huge swaths of territory remain uncharted in the realm of Chinese military small arms. There is still room for discoveries to be made, misconceptions to be struck down, and mysteries to be solved, and I think that's as true as ever when we look at the public security carbon. With that in mind, if you came to this video hoping that I'm going to offer the final word on what these rifles are and are not, fair warning, you are going to leave disappointed. If, however, you are interested in learning exactly what we do and don't know, why none of the prevailing explanations for these rifles really fit the available evidence, what alternative theories might ultimately take their place, and maybe even taking on a bit of that riddle for yourself, stay tuned, because we got a whole lot of that starting right now. All right, so let's start by taking the most basic look at what we're talking about when we say public security carbine. Basically, these are otherwise mechanically unremarkable Type 56 carbines, which exhibit an unusual marking on the right exposed receiver wall, just rearward of the charge and scallop. This marking translates to this, often abbreviated GA, which literally means public security in Chinese. To my Western ear, the correct pronunciation of these words sounds a bit like a noise that an elegant duck might make, so for the purpose of this video, I will just be calling it public security or maybe GA. So, at the simplest level, a public security carbine is a regular Type 56 carbine which has a specific marking on it. But exactly what that marking means is where things start to get a little complicated. Obviously, we're going to dive into that soon, but for the moment, let's just get a few more basic details out of the way. In terms of best estimates for the total number of these rifles in circulation, we're looking at pretty low numbers. At minimum, we've got a few hundred, and at most, not too many more than a thousand, maybe a couple thousand. Additionally, I should note that at the time of posting, I have not seen a single documented example of a public security carbine existing outside of the United States. Once again, that's going to be relevant shortly, and I would be fascinated if this video leads me to being contacted by someone who can provide anecdotal or better direct evidence of such a rifle existing outside of the U.S., but for now, it's just a relevant observation. Furthermore, within this relatively tiny documented population, the rifles themselves are not totally random. Earlier I said a public security carbine is just any other Type 56 carbine with a public security mark on the receiver, but it's a little more complicated than that. You may have read that these carbines come from one of three factories. That's not quite true. There are at least five documented factory marks, but the point is that there are a limited number of factories associated with public security carbines, and those appear to be State Arsenal's 296, 416, 140, 141, and 144. 
My example I'm gonna be showing off today is 141 production. We'll talk about the potential relevance of that specific selection of factories later, but for now we're just noting what has been observed. Now, in addition to these rifles having some consistency in terms of their factories of origin, they also exhibit a fairly consistent pattern in their dates of manufacture. In other words, public security marked carbines from a given factory seem to fall into generally predictable production blocks. For example, public security carbines made at State Arsenal 296 tend to be 8th year or 1963 production. State Arsenal 144 production public security carbines tend to be 24th year or 1979 production. As for 416, we see that serial number range focused around 1972 and 1973, and both 140 and 141 marked rifles are concentrated around 1977. Now, please note this is not gospel. Again, due to the relatively small sample size, we aren't sure exactly how consistent these rules really are. Case in point, my 141 marked rifle is actually marked very early 24th year or 1979, and I think it's safe to assume I'm not the only exception out there. The point for now, however, is that these are not a totally random assortment of rifles, and even with the presumption of exceptions, there is still a clear trend towards orderliness. If you see a public security marking and you see a factory marking, you can predict the serial number range and date of manufacture with reasonable accuracy, and that's noteworthy. Next, and this is a big one, every single one of these rifles was imported by Kang's Firearm Specialty, or KFS, out of Atlanta, Georgia, and is marked as such. Some people claim that Kang's received only a single shipment of these rifles, However, given that we see at least three distinct variations in import marks, I personally think it's safe to assume that Kang's got at least three batches of these things. I'm not an expert in import marking procedure, and unfortunately Kang's did not respond to my requests for comment. They are still in business today, but this is my best interpretation of the evidence. Either way, every one of these rifles, which is publicly documented, does seem to have passed through KFS sometime around 1986. And last but not least, these rifles overwhelmingly tend to be in pretty darn good condition. Obviously, they aren't all in great condition, but like I said, they came into the country about four decades ago, so that shouldn't be terribly surprising. Many of these things have had quite a few owners at this point, and some of those owners have actually used them. That said, as a sub-variant of Type 56 carbine, they do seem to exhibit what I would describe as above-average condition, and therefore I think it's reasonable to infer that as a lot, these rifles were mostly imported in exceptionally good condition. So let's summarize briefly. At the most basic level, a public security carbine is a Type 56 carbine that has a public security stamp on the side. Looks like this. In theory, that may be the only true identification criteria. In practice, there are a few other rules which as of yet appear unbroken. Those rules are, all known public security carbines bear a KFS import mark, all known public security carbines bear a manufacturer mark tracing to state arsenals 296, 416, 140, 141, and 144, all known public security carbines of a given manufacturer have serial numbers indicating production in or around an established date range, and public security carbines tend to be in above average condition. However, for obvious reasons, this is not across the board at this point. So that's what public security rifles are at the most basic level and how they can be identified. But what are they really? That's where this gets a little more complicated. In order to begin answering that question, let's just start with what prevailing wisdom has told us over the years. I'll quote from the Chinese SKS guide here, which as many of you surely know, is one of the single best resources on the internet for all things Type 56 carbine. A Chinese security SKS is a Type 56 carbine produced at one of three specific state-owned slash controlled arsenals expressly for issue to soldiers of the National Public Security Forces and are marked as such. Simple enough, right? If you asked me six months ago, I might have agreed, or at least agreed that it was close enough. Today, however, I'm not so sure, and I'll tell you why. The thing is, when we consider everything we've observed about these carbines, that story just doesn't quite add up. Stick with me here. If you tell me that five different factories produce Type 56 carbines expressly for issue to public security forces and mark them as such, that's plausible. China had an enormous domestic infrastructure which could reasonably fall under the public security label. I'll talk more about what that means later. But for now, the point is there were absolutely several armed elements which fell under a public security classification, and arming any one of those elements with specially marked Type 56 carbines is logical enough. In such a situation, I would expect to see State Arsenals 296 and 416 involved in that production effort, given that those were the factories we already know had experience producing special purpose Type 56 carbines, such as the M21. Indeed, we see exactly that, so everything's looking pretty coherent so far. Next, if you tell me that these hypothetical carbines were made over a 16-year period, again, I've got no immediate problem with that. We know M21s were produced in a similar fashion over roughly the same date range, so it's really not too hard to conceive. Here's the problem. If you want me to believe that these carbines were made at five different factories over a 16-year period, I'm going to need to assume that there was a relatively substantial number of these things made. 
That's the only reasonable outcome when you contract five Chinese State Arsenal production runs spanning the better part of two decades. And if you aren't following my logic here, let me insert a sense of scale. At the peak of production in the mid-1960s, State Arsenal 296 was turning out more than 1,700 complete Type 56 carbines per day. That means that in 12 hours, State Arsenal 296 alone could have produced more public security carbines than we are even sure exist today. So here's the question. If these rifles were produced at five different factories over a 16-year period, where are the rest of them? Why wasn't there a single stray public security carbine mixed in with a different import batch? Why haven't they popped up in Canada or Australia? What about Vietnam or Cambodia, Iran or Iraq, Albania? And perhaps most concerningly, why don't we see them documented in Chinese military journals or referred to by Chinese small arms enthusiasts the way we find documentation and references to M21s? And as I've already warned you, I don't have a definitive answer to these questions. This is the heart of the mystery as far as I'm concerned, and none of the solutions I've heard seem to adequately balance this equation. I'll get to my own working theory in a bit, but first let's break down what those explanations are and why I don't think they're likely to be the whole story. So right off the bat, let's hit the most obvious explanation, which is that these rifles are faked. There are two circumstances under which that might have made sense. First, I would not at all put it past Chinese exporters or U.S. importers to make up a fake marking and a story for marketing purposes. We've seen stuff like that before. Second, and this is a much more interesting explanation, I think, there may have been an incentive to falsely mark military weapons as police weapons for legal reasons. Now, the reason I say this is a more interesting explanation is because one of the myths that has seemed to follow these rifles since the 1980s is that they were one of the first batches of Chinese SKS patterns to get into the U.S., and they were only allowed to get in because they were police weapons rather than military weapons. I had always dismissed this story because I don't actually think they were one of the first batches to get in, and I'm not aware of any U.S. law that has ever made such a distinction, but I got pretty excited when I realized it might never have been a U.S. law at all, but rather a Chinese law. Something important to be aware of is that during the mid-1980s, China was sending a large amount of military hardware, including Type 56 carbines, to both sides of the Iran-Iraq war, and there's a possibility that for some period, the Chinese Communist Party put a temporary halt on the commercial exportation of military weapons in order to prioritize military shipments to the Middle East. Under these or similar circumstances, it might make sense for a frustrated commercial exporter to cleverly remark a small batch of military Type 56 carbines as public security in order to complete a cash sale with the U.S. market rather than have a green-suited representative of the Chinese people repossess that inventory for government use. It's purely speculation. However, like I said, I got a little excited by this theory because I often do find that apocryphal gunshot myths have a seed of truth to them, even if they've otherwise departed greatly from reality. And in that way, this would have been a rather satisfying explanation. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized there was a big problem with that and any other theory which suggests that these markings were faked. The problem is the font of the public security markings is not the same on all rifles. You should see some pictures on screen now that show quite clearly that the public security markings were not all made by the same stamp. I don't know anything about the Chinese language, but I like shapes, and I know enough about shapes to know that these shapes are not the same. If this was done to a small batch of rifles immediately before or after export, whether for marketing, legal, or any other reason, I would expect those stampings to be done at the same time, using the same stamps and the same font. The fact that we see different stamps and fonts tells me that these stampings were almost certainly done by some combination of different people in different locations at different times, and that really undermines any theory in which these stamps are faked. By itself, this is actually really compelling evidence that these rifles were authentically manufactured or later designated for public security purposes. It just doesn't get us any closer to understanding why so few of them are documented. And by the way, for anyone thinking to themselves, well, maybe they just switched the stamp at the same time they switched up the style of the import marking, I had that thought too, so I checked. I could find no correlation between the style of public security marking and the style of import marking. If there was a correlation, I think we could call this case open and shut, but that's not what we see. In fact, I couldn't even find a correlation between the style of public security marking and the factory of origin. To me, this indicates with moderate to high probability that these rifles were not given these public security markings at the time of manufacture, but rather were marked later, probably at different times in small lots from various manufacturers pulled from military inventory. And this kind of makes sense to me because we know it was common for Chinese rifles to be issued and stored alongside rifles which were made at the same factory at the same time. As another piece of evidence for that specific conclusion, we can refer back to the M21 rifles. At time of manufacture, M21s were given a specific model designation in the normal location, which differentiated them from Type 56 carbines being made at the same time. 
If these rifles were given specialized markings at their time of manufacture, knowing what we know about Chinese specialized Type 56 carbine manufacture, we would expect those markings to be applied to the standard location on the receiver, which is to say the left side, and the fact that this marking is applied to the right side of the receiver to me indicates it was done somewhere other than the factory of origin. So let's keep thinking about this. If we're working under the assumption that these rifles are authentic, we still need to explain why so few of them are documented and why they were limited to a very small import run. One possibility is precisely the opposite of the law enforcement exception theory. Maybe there are a ton of these things out there, but unlike their military counterparts, they never qualified for exportation because they were never made obsolete during law enforcement service. As I understand it, there are still tons of rural Chinese law enforcement units that issue Type 56 carbines to this day, so it's possible that the one batch of these things that reach an exporter was just a fluke. And this is possible, but I just don't think it's likely because I would still expect there to be at least one photograph of one of these things that doesn't have a KFS import mark on it. I would expect at least one Chinese language forum to have one comment from someone who remembers seeing this marking on a rifle in China. And maybe those photos and comments are out there, but I've looked pretty darn hard and I can't find them. So hopefully now you're starting to get a lay of the land. I'm always willing to listen to people's stories and look at their sources, but at the end of the day, I always defer to the rifles themselves and try to let them tell their own story. And in this case, at least for me at this time, these rifles just aren't ready to let their secrets go. No one will be more excited than me if in a few months or years I can make an update video which penetrates the subject a little bit more deeply, but for now I won't pretend to know what I don't know and I won't pretend to explain what I can't explain. So before we move on to the next section, let's summarize. When we try to understand what these rifles are, we run into a little problem. And by little problem, I mean a huge problem. And that problem is that the observable and documented properties of these rifles don't point to a single coherent explanation for their existence. The fact that there are so few examples and all known examples traced to a single importer is not consistent with the theory that these rifles were produced and issued on a large scale. The fact that these rifles bear professionally finished and inconsistent GA markings is not consistent with the theory that these rifles were remanufactured on a small scale. And the thing is, anytime we get data points that appear to be pulling us in opposite directions, like we have here, that usually tells us that we're missing a pretty important piece of the puzzle, something that ties these seemingly paradoxical observations together and I haven't found that piece of the puzzle yet. With all that said, I'm not gonna leave you totally high and dry here either. If you picked one of these things up, pointed at my head, and forced me to guess what the most likely explanation is, I would have an answer for you, albeit a completely speculative one. I do believe these rifles are authentic. And by authentic, I mean I suspect that whoever applied these markings to these rifles did so with the sincere intention of designating them for public security use rather than for skirting restrictions or drumming up business. Part of that belief is simply rooted in the intangibles of experience with this family of rifles, as when you spend as much time as I do obsessing over Type 56 carbines, you start to pick up on the subtleties and minutiae of different markings and finish types, and to me, the finished markings present on public security carbines read as official rather than commercial. The other part of that belief is rooted in my own entirely unsubstantiated theory about what these things are and where they came from. As you can imagine, I've spent a lot of time trying to come up with an explanation that accounts for the paradoxical properties of these weapons, and while I have absolutely no direct evidence for it, I have come up with a theory that I think kind of fits, or at least fits a little better than any of the theories we've covered so far. I do think it's possible that despite the immense scale of the Chinese public security apparatus, there may have been a specific and relatively small public security organization which for whatever reason decided to mark their issued rifles. Perhaps this was a small branch of a national organization, perhaps it was a specific regional agency, but in any case, it was a single insulated organization which arranged to have their own issued rifles specifically marked. This agency was of the sort where they were required to give the appearance of being armed and made a serious effort to present that image in a polished way, but didn't really have to use their weapons. Like any other organization, they were issued small lots of consistently serialized weapons from different factories, and they marked and refinished them upon issue. Different weapon lots were sourced at different times over the years, which would explain the professionalism but lack of consistency seen in the GA stampings, as these stampings would have been applied at different times. At such time that this agency finally retired the Type 56 carbine, they had amassed a small collection of these rifles, which again had been sourced, marked, and added to inventory over a period of more than a decade, and therefore showed some degree of inconsistency, but maintained the same core professional standards. This agency's unique rifles were all turned in at the same time, and due to the small size of the lot, they ended up staying together and were exported to a single distributor in the US. And let me say one more time with zero ambiguity, this is pure speculation. Not only could it be wrong, it probably is wrong. 
But gun to my head, that would be my best guess to explain what these rifles are and why they exist. It's far from an airtight theory, but it does seem to me at least to be a little bit more plausible than any of the other explanations we've gone over. So with that section resolved, albeit unsatisfactorily, let's move on to talking a little bit about what public security actually means in a Chinese context. Surprise, surprise, this is also somewhat complicated. Basically, there are two main organizations which can and have fallen under the public security label. The first is a purely civilian police force, which falls under the Ministry of Public Security. And the second is a hybrid paramilitary police force, which at the time these rifles were relevant, fell under the dual command of both the Ministry of Public Security as well as the Central Military Commission. Both of these organizations are gigantic. Both of these organizations use or have used the Type 56 carbine. And both of these organizations could have realistically contained elements that might have commissioned public security markets weapons. In Western collecting circles, the overwhelming consensus seems to be that these weapons were designated for the People's Armed Police, which is the paramilitary organization, but in Chinese circles, the consensus seems to be the opposite. For my two cents, I will say that I find the Chinese argument to be a little bit more compelling, and my reasoning is pretty simple. The difference between the People's Police and the People's Armed Police, despite what their names might imply, is not the presence of arms. Well, it's definitely not the presence of small arms like the Type 56 carbine, they both have those. The People's Police probably doesn't have as many self-propelled howitzers as the People's Armed Police does, but that's not what we're talking about here. The real difference between the People's Police and the People's Armed Police, as far as I'm aware, goes back to the fact that one is a civilian organization with civilian leadership, and one is a paramilitary organization with military leadership. If one was to entertain the notion of specially marking a government-produced weapon for public security use, it would make a lot more sense to me to mark the weapon that was going to the civilian organization rather than the one that was staying under the military umbrella. We have examples of this in our own culture. Does the U.S. Army National Guard get specially marked M4s compared to those being issued by the active army? Of course not. Same organization, same command structure, same procurement channels, same weapons. We do, however, see plenty of AR-15s which are specially marked for civilian law enforcement use. It's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, I know, and having been an armor in the U.S. Army National Guard for a period of time, I do know there are some specially marked guard weapons, but those are always specialized or atypically procured weapons, not general issue carbines. It just doesn't make any sense in this context. In any case, if these rifles were indeed officially marked for public security use, I'm guessing that those markings were at least in part designating that the weapons no longer belong to the Central Military Commission and instead belong to a civilian police agency which fell under the Ministry of Public Security. As for the opposing argument that these rifles were indeed associated with the paramilitary police force, as far as I can discern, the heart of that argument is paramilitary sounds cooler, so we think we should go with that one. Not super compelling. So let's take a break from all this analysis and just look at one of these things now. As previously stated, this is my 1979 example produced at State Arsenal 141, also known as Guzhou Province Anshan Wind and Thunder Machinery. We'll talk more about that factory in a moment, but for now let's focus on the rifle itself. As we talked about in the identification section, there isn't much interesting going on in terms of the mechanics of this rifle. Given that at its core it's just another 1970s non-26 rifle, there aren't any real rules about what we would expect to see, and what we do see is a reflection of State Arsenal 141's production standards rather than the public security variant specifically. That said, we've got a fairly typical Catalpa wood stock with a somewhat atypical stylization of the production number stamping. We've got a side sling swivel, a stamp trigger guard, and a decidedly above average trigger, which would be best compared to the French Tickler variant being manufactured in Chongqing at the same time, a variant I know many friends of this channel have experience with. We've got a non-lightning cut bolt carrier, standard short lug threaded barrel interface, a two-piece gas tube, and a non-lightning cut riveted bayonet assembly. One somewhat interesting feature here is we do have the Latin letter D marked rear sight, which is not something you see every day with Chinese carbines, but it is out there. Finally, my example does have what appears to be its original sling. In other words, we've got a fairly typical 1970s non-26 Type 56 carbine, albeit that's an extremely broad category. In terms of markings, again, nothing super noteworthy. The basic markings are what we would expect. We've got the three character Chinese Type 56 model designation. We've got a rectangle 0141 maker's mark, and we have a standard format production number and representational date code. It's worth noting that my example has a very low production number, indicating that it was one of the first 800 rifles made that year, but I don't think there's much we can read into that. I have no idea what kind of volume Factory 141 was doing in 1979, but either way, it's not like we're talking about State Arsenal 296 in the mid-1960s here, when they were whipping out 800 rifles in 10 hours. I bet it was closer to 800 rifles a month. In terms of the specific public security markings, all we really have is the small type KFS import mark and the GA marking itself, and that's really it. Obviously, this rifle is in generally handsome condition, and for whatever it's worth, it does run great. I'll speak to that more in collector considerations, but otherwise, there's not a whole lot else to say. 
Not a bad rifle by any stretch of imagination, but aside from one deeply curious marking on the right side of the receiver, it's pretty typical for an otherwise unremarkable era of production. Given that I didn't have a whole lot to say about the rifle itself, the last thing I wanna to touch on before we move into collector considerations is going to be Factory 141 itself. With the assistance of an extremely knowledgeable friend of the channel, I was actually able to dig up some really cool information that I think Type 56 carbine enthusiasts generally, and fellow 141 owners especially, will probably appreciate. As previously stated, the proper name for State Arsenal 141 is Guzhou Province Anshan Wind and Thunder Machinery, also called the Feng Lei Company. Company. This is one of the more recognizable proper names for Chinese State Arsenal, presumably because Wind and Thunder just sounds cool. As previously established, American collectors place quite a premium on things that sound cool. My understanding is that this name was chosen because State Arsenal 141 primarily made aviation ordnance, and indeed, Wind and Thunder is a pretty badass name to choose for a factory that primarily makes aerial delivery explosives. Kind of like how the Russians named a machine gun factory Hammer or Molot, I think it's just a nice touch. Certainly more evocative than State Arsenal 296's proper name of Jianshi, which literally just means construction. That's like naming a restaurant cooking. Come on, guys. Be cool. In any case, my research contact turned me on to a really cool Chinese social media video made by vloggers who go by the name of Dolphin Trip. I'll roll a few clips here and link the full video in my description. However, the main takeaway is that these Chinese vloggers recently visited the mostly abandoned site of Factory 141, interviewed some of the remaining workers that live on site, and gave really cool insight, not just into this specific factory, but into the reality of Chinese Type 56 carbine manufacture and the third front military industrial movement in general. For those that are not aware, the Chinese term third front refers to a Mao era movement to insulate the Chinese military industry from potential conflict with the United States or the Soviet Union. Essentially, the third front refers to a large region of central China, which would be set back from the presumed front lines or first front of such a conflict, creating a huge separation between infrastructure targets and battlefield targets. In my opinion, this policy reflects an insightful and fundamentally correct analysis of the Second World War, which is that nations with geographically isolated production infrastructure tend to outlast adversaries in protracted conflicts. Of course, communist China being communist China, this massive social restructuring wasn't exactly voluntary all the time, and many of the workers who were pressed into service at third front factories were literally just farmers who were rounded up at gunpoint and told they were now factory workers. One of the elderly former workers interviewed in the Dolphin Trip vlog describes more or less this experience. Another important takeaway of this video is a visual demonstration that Chinese state arsenals are not like U.S. ordnance factories, and that's an important historical detail to be aware of. If you've ever heard terms like State Arsenal 123 and imagined a normal U.S. factory that people commute to and from, that's not at all the beast that was created by the Chinese Third Front. State Arsenal 141 was essentially a self-sufficient city, complete with schools, hospitals, marketplaces, cultural centers, movie theaters, and everything else required to sustain workers and help them raise future generations of workers. There's a great part of the video where they find tickets to a spring festival held for factory workers and their families. Not exactly a fate I would personally want for myself or my family, but from a purely tactical perspective, it's a pretty formidable strategy. Long story short, Factory 141, like many Chinese state arsenals, isn't really a factory at all. It's actually a whole community in which every aspect of life is ultimately focused around large-scale production of military hardware. Again, probably not a whole lot of fun for the people who participated, especially the ones that didn't really have the freedom to leave, even if they wanted to. But from another perspective, I think it really should instill some degree of respect for the Chinese willpower. I've made no secret on this channel that I have painfully little sympathy for the communists, but if we can put that aside for a second, I do still think there's room to appreciate that when you totally give up on individual human rights, you can accomplish some pretty amazing things, and this is an example of that. It's also just a glimpse into the real history that these rifles connect us to, and that's pretty much the whole point of my channel. So thanks again to the friend of this channel who helped me find that information. You know who you are, and I appreciate you. So I suppose the last thing we need to talk about here is collector considerations, and there's really only a few points we need to hit here, although they are important ones. First, let's just speak briefly to one of the more popular collector myths about public carry carbines, which is that they were manufactured to higher standards than regular Type 56 carbines. Right off the bat, I've already called this a myth, which probably gave away my stance on this claim. Without going into a hopefully unnecessary rant, it's an extraordinarily implausible claim considering everything we know about Chinese small arms generally, and this variant specifically. Just because a handful of people over the years have remarked that their public security carbines shoot exceptionally well does not mean that five different factories created five different technical data packages or opened five different Chinese equivalents of the Smith & Wesson Performance Center for the sole purpose of making roughly a thousand marginally better versions of an already highly refined design. 
That makes no sense. And as I've already mentioned, I don't even believe that these were manufactured to be public security carbines. I think that distinction took place outside of the factory of origin. Is it possible that the organization that marked these rifles picked particularly good ones? Maybe. I'm not sure. Again, it seems a little unlikely, but at least that's more likely than them being manufactured differently. Another really obvious explanation for the observation that these things tend to shoot well is the simple fact that these things generally are in pretty good condition. And surprise, surprise, rifles in above average condition tend to exhibit above average performance. Seems pretty straightforward to me. As for my sample size of one, for whatever it's worth, I did actually experience this above average performance. I've only had the opportunity to shoot this rifle one time. However, I did notice that its trigger was exceptionally good. It cycled smoothly and I was shooting marginally better groups than I would typically expect from an SKS pattern carbine in my hands. Nothing crazy, but noteworthy all the same. All that said, this is an extremely subjective and unscientific data point. And it should also be noted that the same day I was shooting this guy, I also noticed that I was shooting some other firearms I own better than I usually do. Regardless, it doesn't change my core opinion on this myth. I can't imagine any scenario in which these rifles were actually manufactured differently than any other Type 56 carbine, and whether they were potentially hand-selected at one point, or more likely they just happened to be in really good condition, their performance is still well within the performance envelope for a regular Type 56 carbine. As a category, they tend to perform pretty well anyway. So really the only other thing to talk about in collector considerations is going to be, should you buy one of these things, and if so, what if any premium would be reasonable to pay? This is kind of a tricky one, it always is. On one side of the coin, for whatever else these may or may not be, they are still an objectively distinct and rare variant. I personally wanted one, and I wouldn't blame others with similar interests for wanting one for themselves. On the other side of the coin, they really are a bit mysterious, and that introduces a real layer of risk from both a collecting and investment perspective. Many Type 56 carbines, including ones I've covered on this channel, come with very specific and verifiable stories, which connect their owners to rich and well-established history. I'm not really sure that's the case here, because at the end of the day, the true story of these rifles isn't exactly public knowledge. There is a chance they are fake. There's a chance they're connected to something truly remarkable. There's a really big chance they're connected to something relatively uninteresting, and there's probably an even bigger chance still that it may be some time before we know one way or another with certainty. So what do we do with that? Obviously, it's up to you. For my two cents, I do think it's a great thing to add to an SKS collection if you've already got some staple pieces, but it's not necessarily where I would start my collection. In other words, if I could only own one Type 56 carbine, it definitely wouldn't be this one. Luckily, I'm not limited to one, so here we are. That said, if the realities of adulthood ever force me to trim down my SKS collection, this guy will probably be one of the first to go on the chopping block. Not saying I don't like it a lot, I do, but the reality is that my passion for SKSs is ultimately a passion for history, and I'm not sure exactly what moment and what people in history this example connects me to. As for pricing, again, that's a personal choice. Many people feel strongly that given the unclear and almost certainly exaggerated history of these rifles, that they should not command a premium. That's a fair argument, I guess, but it ultimately ignores the reality of supply and demand. Regardless of the uncertainty that surrounds these rifles, one thing we are certain about is that there aren't a lot of them to go around, and therefore the ratio of supply to demand is always going to be a losing proposition for buyers. I always get a kick out of people writing YouTube comments saying, I would never pay X dollars for that, because that's not how the collector market works. There are probably only a couple dozen of these actively for sale at any given moment in the world. So even if billions of people abstain from bidding, it literally only takes a handful of interested parties to create competition and therefore price increase. So regardless of how much anyone thinks these should cost, if you want one, be prepared that you're probably going to end up paying about 25 to 50% more than you would pay for a more common Type 56 carbine. That's what I paid on this one, and you better believe that if I sell it, that's what I'm going to get out of it as well. And that's today's video, guys. As always, if you found it entertaining, educational, or otherwise worth the time you spent watching it, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could take the time to do any combination of hitting like, subscribe, or leaving me a comment. It doesn't take much time for you, but it does a whole lot of good for me. If you're interested in seeing more SKS content, please check out my SKS playlist. Tons of good content in there, and I'm adding to it all the time. If you don't find what you're looking for, consider shooting me a comment, and who knows, it might just be the next SKS-themed video. And with that, thanks again for taking the time to join me today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.